Christianity was once a monolithic religion, with traditions not of questioning and rebellion, but of doctrine and obedience. As the 1500s dawned, the Roman Catholic Church dominates almost every aspect of European life. Political boundaries mean little, since even kings bow down to the church. In a sense, the Pope is the ruler of the Western world. Challenging the Catholic Church, either politically or spiritually, seems unthinkable. Its main source of power was that it taught, and people really believed, that if they made a misstep, they would burn in hell forever, and if they were on the right side of things, they would have bliss forever. But the Church's leaders do not always behave in accordance with their dictates. Priests having wives are taking money for forgiving sins uh, is an old story in the Church. The interesting point is now people looked more critical at the Church because they were now more concerned with their own piety and also the question of the afterlife. In 1492, the year Christopher Columbus first reaches the New World, Pope Alexander VI becomes the head of the Church. Alexander is from the Borgia family, notorious for corruption and decadence. Although all priests in the Catholic Church are supposed to be celibate, Alexander has had several children with his mistresses. I think every Catholic historian of the last 30, 40, 50 years would say that the papacy was at its lowest point. Uh, the Borgia family and other families, uh, political figures, princes, uh, were essentially buying the papacy. To fund this elaborate lifestyle, the Pope targets his rich enemies. They are accused of trumped-up crimes, imprisoned and often murdered. Afterwards, the Church confiscates their properties. On one infamous night, according to widely told tales, the Papal Palace hosts a grand orgy. Fifty prostitutes writhe on a floor scattered with chestnuts. Priests and other officials who perform with the most women are given prizes. Many people are outraged by stories like these. But in 1517, one man in this tiny German town of Wittenberg will turn the course of church history. It is remarkable that a monk got this all started in an obscure university town. And I always compare it to this gasoline over the garage floor and all Martin Luther had to do was toss a match. Born in 1483, Martin Luther is originally headed for a career as a lawyer, a career he took up at the insistence of his father. There's none of that sort of revolutionary, rebellious nature in the background of Martin Luther. There's nothing which gives you the indication this was a man destined to confront the Catholic Church or change European history. But at 21, Luther commits his first act of rebellion, leaving his family and his studies to become an Augustinian monk. For the next 12 years, Luther tries to find peace within the teachings of the Catholic Church. You have to understand that Luther was a good monk. He did all the right things in the old system. He said mass, he went to confession. But gnawing away at him was a sense of unworthiness, of an angry God. Luther wrote, I scrupulously carried out the penances which were allotted to me, and yet my conscience kept nagging. You fell short there. You were not sorry enough. You left that sin off your list. Life in the monastery is made up of hard work, frequent prayer, and fasting. As a monk, Luther is obsessive in his search for personal purity and struggles to understand his relationship with God. His confessions are epic in their length. There are not a lot of sins you could do in a monastery, and. Uh, he really had to work at it, but he could confess for six hours 
One time his confessor said, Brother Martin, you don't have to confess every fart to me. It doesn't have to be that serious. That was at the core of Luther's angst, this haunting question, have I done enough to please God? What is my posture in the presence of this demanding God of a church that requires so much from me to be acceptable? Luther scours the Bible for answers while teaching theology in the small university town of Wittenberg. The last straw for Luther, a church practice that scandalizes him, the selling of what are called indulgences. It was believed that while none of us could pile up enough good works to be saved, the saints had done a superabundance of them. And they developed a kind of a treasury of merits and graces that could be drawn upon. Access to that treasury is what the church sells to the people, for themselves, for friends, for loved ones who have already died, or even for sins to be committed in the future. This is a so-called letter of indulgence. People believed that it was a kind of insurance. Not a life insurance, but an afterlife insurance. The idea being that once you've bought such a letter, you could safely go to heaven. And of course, the letter is printed, meaning mass production. The letter is in Latin, meaning an official church document. You have blank spaces for the name of the buyer, and also the date is filled in by hand, and the price for which it has been sold. What Luther could see in the Bible was no justification for this, that this was a completely man-made uh, tradition, almost a, a scam. And as a result, he was incredibly worried for the salvation of those people who were buying into it. The man who sells indulgences around Wittenberg is a Dominican friar, Johann Tetzel. Tetzel is part preacher, part huckster. He would come into town uh, with a bandwagon, uh, create a big crowd, and there's this wonderful phrase of, every time I hear the money fall into the pot, another soul escapes to heaven. He was one of the, uh, the Catholic Church's great showmen uh, of the mid-16th century. For Martin Luther, this spectacle is a sign that the Catholic Church has lost its way. He fears for the souls of those who think that their fate in the afterlife can be bought. Luther turns to the Bible for an answer. The progress of Martin Luther from a good Catholic monk to uh, the father of the Reformation is a long, tortuous, intellectual process. At the heart of it is a reading of the Bible and a rereading of the Bible. He finds a passage in Paul's letter to the Romans that will set in motion an unstoppable chain of events. When Luther read Paul, he saw the same agony, but he also saw the affirmation that God will save, regardless of the fact that you and I are utterly worthless. God will save us in his infinite love. The passage reads, For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. He who through faith is righteous shall live. You don't need uh, all the traditions of the church. You just need that powerful individual relationship with God. It is a revolutionary idea. Salvation comes not from the man-made rituals of the church, but by faith alone. This means that not the Pope, not the Vatican, not even a priest is necessary to ensure a person's entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Luther explained that for the first time when he found out the true meaning of this quote in Romans, he felt he understood in a moment the whole of the word of God. And that set Luther free and of course set the Reformation in process. For Luther, this is a shattering personal revelation. He has no way of knowing that it will turn the Vatican upside down, launch wars and revolutions. 
and ultimately become one of the most important events in the history of the Western world. What happens next is the stuff of legend. On October 31st, 1517, the 33-year-old priest follows a time-honored tradition. If you've ever been on a campus, you've seen a bulletin board where there are eight layers deep of things posted, and uh, they're usually announcements. And at this particular church, in this particular university town, one of the most popular things would be to put a note up, they're gonna have a debate. Luther wants to start his debate with a set of ideas about what is wrong with the church. His so-called theses, 95 in all, are formally titled Disputation on the Power and Efficacy of Indulgences. They go beyond the sale of indulgences to address the limits of papal power. They were not meant as a general criticism uh, on the practice of indulgence selling. The criticism was just mildly asking if it would not be better to help your neighbors than just buying letters of indulgences. What you must remember about the beginning of the Reformation is that nobody wanted to invent a new church. He wanted a debate within the church. He wanted to have this discussed uh, and resolved within the authority of the church. That doesn't happen. In writing his theses, Martin Luther is setting himself up for a showdown with Pope Leo X, the most powerful man in the Western world. Yet the Pope's authority will not subdue the German monk. Martin Luther will stand firm. And that's the thing about Luther. Once he'd come to that viewpoint, he wasn't going back on it. The devout young man has no idea what he is about to unleash. I'm not sure Luther's intent was to set loose the Reformation that has really changed the world, but it certainly was the consequence of what he did. In 1517, an obscure German Catholic priest named Martin Luther takes a radical stand and refuses to budge. He claims that the Bible promises salvation to anyone who believes the Word of God. He takes his inspiration from the words of St. Paul in the Book of Romans. I am not ashamed of the Gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. The righteous will live by faith. Luther's interpretation of this passage challenges the role of the Roman Catholic Church as the representative of Christ and its power to determine who was going to heaven and who was going to hell. He believes that for this heresy he will be put to death. Somebody excommunicated by the church uh, was normally burned at the stake. Uh, this was the normal procedure. So this was a point of living in danger. A revolutionary invention gives Luther's ideas a wider audience than any other reformer has ever had before. In the 1440s, Johannes Gutenberg creates the printing press. His use of movable type can make multiple copies of a document, allowing it to be widely distributed. Without Gutenberg, no Reformation. That's quite clear. Uh, because the Reformation is the first media revolution in the modern sense of the word. Gutenberg's printing press. You almost have to compare that to the invention of radio and television in our time. Suddenly, um, ordinary people could read. Gutenberg's press opens up the world of ideas as never before. And uh, Luther was a genius writing. He had uh, a whole range of uh, styles and emotions. He could be scientific, he could be popular. He could be funny, he could be serious. And of course, he had something which nobody else had. He had the ability for irony. In 1521, Luther is summoned to appear before the Pope's political commander for that area, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. 
the emperor opens an official church meeting called a diet in the German town of Worms. There, he gives Luther a final chance to recant. If Luther had backed off and compromised the diet, I think the thing would have fizzled. He would have been one more of the many young professors that were thinking new thoughts. But Luther confronts Charles with these words. Unless I am proved wrong by scriptures or by evident reason, then I am a prison in conscience to the word of God. I cannot retract and I will not retract. To go against the conscience is neither safe nor right. Once he believed that his own salvation and the salvation of those around him uh, was dependent upon this different approach to a religious life, there was no way uh, he could junk those opinions. He was saying in the end, I must defy you in the name of God. There is nothing else that I can do in this situation. That was a revolutionary moment. Martin Luther has now officially stood up against the Catholic Church. The Diet of Worms is firstly the breakthrough of Luther's popularity. From then on, everybody in the German Empire knew his name, and it's also the beginning of a long development of the question, what means Christian liberty? In Worms, Charles V, with Pope Leo's permission, declares Luther a heretic and banishes him from the Holy Roman Empire. To be declared a heretic and banished meant you're deprived of all civil rights. You are not physically protected. People could do things to you. And theoretically, from the excommunication until Luther's death, almost any day anybody in Europe could have killed him with impunity. But Luther is one step ahead of the church. One of his supporters, Prince Friedrich of Saxony, offers Luther shelter here in Wartburg Castle. He stages a kidnapping to remove Luther from the public's eye. Many of Germany's leading princes rather like the idea of Luther's challenge not only to the church, but with it to the authority of the Holy Roman Emperor. So Luther is protected because of the political possibilities of his religious challenge to the church. That challenge soon turns into a full-fledged rebellion. And it quickly threatens the church's political, as well as religious, power. In the 16th century, religion and society and politics were so closely intermeshed Luther's challenge to the authority of the Catholic Church necessarily had these extraordinary consequences. Here in Wartburg Castle, Martin Luther took refuge for 10 months following the Diet of Worms. He lived in this small room. Luther takes on a new identity, living as Squire George and growing a beard to avoid being recognized by his enemies. Confined to the castle grounds, Luther begins the next stage of his rebellion, translating the New Testament into German. The Word of God and the Bible was given to all people, so everybody should understand it. And uh, in translating, you should make this understanding easier, not more difficult. The freedom of the word given to all people. When Luther translates the Bible into the language of the people, that means everyone has access to the Word of God. At the time, the Bible is generally printed in Latin or Greek, languages that the common people cannot understand. Only priests are allowed to read and interpret the Bible. It was definitely no point of return because Luther was just one voice, but once you give the uh, readings and the voice to the people, that's when, um, that's when the revolution begins. Martin Luther is now a Lutheran. He also establishes one of the fundamental principles of Protestantism, the priesthood of all believers, that everyone has a direct relationship to God. The way that the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers came across it was deeply revolutionary. Luther is very clear and all the reformers are very clear. Your calling is to be a particular sort of human being. 
and your calling is to be in Christ, exercising the work of Christ as best you can in your circumstances. Martin Luther has unleashed a wave of ideas over which he has no control. Within eight years of Luther's 95 Theses, you're already beginning to see those, those tensions, those political, social tensions within Protestantism, uh, which begin to spill out for the next hundreds of years. Protestantism begins as a rebellion against authority. Luther's confronting the Catholic Church. Now, other rebellions follow, based in the same spirit of questioning authority that Luther introduced. The Reformation has a great fault line in it about obedience. On the one hand, you've got Paul saying in Romans 13, verse 1, obey the superior powers, because the superior powers are of God. But on the other hand, you've got that statement in the book of Acts, it is better to obey God than man. And Protestants are a bit caught on that. In 1525, Luther will see his ideas played out with extreme violence. After years of bad harvests, persecutions, and heavy taxes, the German peasantry rises up in revolt. And a man named Thomas Munzer tries to put himself at the head of it, hoping to make a peasant's revolt into a religious crusade. Thomas Munzer is trying to give it a theological Protestant spin to create that link between the idea of a spiritual equality, that Lutheran idea of a priesthood of all believers, and a social equality, the idea almost that because you are in the same relationship to God, you should also have that same social relationship here on earth. Luther rejects Munzer's ideas and tries to stop the peasants' rebellion. He's always adamant that you should obey the magistrate, you should obey the prince, you should obey the king. And so he comes down very hard uh, against Munzer. In turn, uh, Munzer uh, thinks Luther's become little better than a pope. On a German field, Munzer's followers join more than 7,000 peasants to confront an army controlled by local princes. As they await the battle, a halo appears around the sun. Munzer proclaims that it is God's sign that they will win. In 1525, the revolution unleashed by Martin Luther's 95 Theses turns into a violent rebellion. In what is now Germany, a man named Thomas Munzer hopes to turn a peasant rebellion into a religious crusade against the noblemen who control the land. But when the battle comes, nearly 6,000 peasants are slaughtered, compared to just six men from the royal army. Munzer himself is captured, tortured, and executed. His impaled head serves as a warning for anyone else hoping to use Luther's Reformation to turn society upside down. At the same time, a powerful new technology is helping spread information throughout Europe. The printing press, which mass-produced the Catholic indulgences that Martin Luther railed against, now brings his message to a vast new audience. One startling notion Luther proposes, the traditional priestly state of celibacy is not inherently a better way to live. He argues instead, for a happy domestic life. On the basis of his reading of the Bible, he was long convinced that um, Catholicism was making too much of celibacy and chastity and so on. It wasn't one's natural state. So Luther, as you read him, is quite earthy, quite earthy about his marital life, quite earthy about love and sexuality in a sense that this is the goodness of creation. Luther is ready to practice what he preached. In June 1525, at the age of 41, he commits an act that goes against centuries of Catholic law. Martin Luther gets married. His wife is Catherine von Bora, a 26-year-old former nun. 
Luther's marriage is a rather strange story because he started simply by marrying out of a sense of duty. He thought that to show that he was a man like any other man and not a special person because he was a clergyman, had to get married. Luther believes that of all his revolutionary ideas, the changes he makes to marriage are among the most important. It also transforms his own life. He and Catherine go on to have six children. Luther enjoyed family life enormously. Uh, he goes from being uh, this withdrawn, gaunt, agonized monk to this kind of family man. He gets on well with his wife. He loves his children. Luther, for example, loved to say that the woman washing diapers is doing something far more pleasing to God than the monk saying his prayers. Can you imagine how that reoriented one's sense of oneself, that we are called by God into everyday life, and there we do things that both please God and serve others. It literally gave daily life meaning as the context of faith. In less than two decades, the ideas of the Protestant Reformation have grown from one man's crusade to reform the church to a revolution that sweeps through Europe in the 1530s. At the same time as Protestant ideas are inspiring violence in England, another reformer is leading his own radical charge in Switzerland. His name is John Calvin. Calvin is initially inspired by his contemporary Martin Luther. But the two reformers are very different men. I think one test showing the difference between Calvin and Luther is whether you'd enjoy a night out with them. It's quite clear you'd have a very good time with Luther. I'm not so sure with Calvin. He was austere, serious, concentrated. He knew he had a job to do. He is a preacher and a persistent reformer. Calvin is born in France in 1509 and educated in the law and humanities. Like Luther, he finds a more spiritual calling. Here in the cold mountain air of Geneva, the school of Protestantism that emerges from Calvin's teachings is a harsh, uncompromising faith. I think one of the great selling points of the Reformation was actually its discipline. Everyone desperately wanted discipline in the 16th century, Catholics and Protestants alike. Perhaps the most radical difference between Calvin's beliefs and Luther's is called predestination. Predestination means that of all the people on earth, God has chosen a lucky few called the elect who will be saved. Those who are not in the elect will be damned for eternity. Here is the most extraordinary statement of the majesty and glory and liberty of God. Forget for a moment about people being predestined to hell and just think, Calvin is putting before you the vision of a God who is constrained by nothing except his own nature. He's absolutely free, he can do what he likes. And so it is a scary doctor. If he predestines you to be saved, he must be predestining you to be condemned. Um, and so God's foreknowledge, very complex teaching that God foresees everything. In Calvin's doctrine, no amount of good works by an individual can force God to change his holy mind. In Luther's teaching, he starts with God is gracious, and then he has to back up and figure out if God is determining this, where does grace fit in? Calvin starts at the other end. God determines everything and then is gracious. But predestination put Calvinists in a terrible bind. They yearn to find some way to know whether they are part of the elect, destined for paradise or not. While Calvin and his followers reject the old Catholic notion that good works can provide salvation, they come up with a new idea, that good works might demonstrate if you are among the elect to be saved. Calvinists were by far the most activist of any Protestants. They were always busy doing God's work, and in their sense, they were proving that they were elect, proving to themselves Predestination can be liberating and empowering, but it can be terrifying because you cannot be sure that God has predestined you. In the world of work, Protestants find an answer to their painful spiritual predicament. One of the signs, it was believed, of election was that you were 
successful in your profession, you were successful in, in the world around you. So the more you prospered, the more you earned, the clearer it was you were predestined to heaven. So you have this close correlation between the idea of being saved and the idea of being successful. The harder Calvinists work, the more likely they are to prosper. The more they prosper, the more convinced they become of their own salvation. This uncompromising religious stance will play a powerful role in creating modern capitalism. For a thousand years, the Catholic Church condemned the practice of money lending, or usury, as sinful. The Christian wasn't supposed to take an interest. Taking of interest was seen as taking advantage of somebody and of stealing. But for Calvin, money, like human beings, belongs to a world of work, and work is a godly activity. Money should be made useful, not stowed away in a bank vault. This seismic shift in thought helps lead to a lifting of the ban on charging interest throughout Northern Europe. Protestants can now compete with the likes of the powerful Medici family of Italy, who have set up a system of banking throughout Europe. Calvin, among the Protestants, picks up what's also going on in Venice and others, that some people think he's a co-founder of capitalism, almost. On February 18th, 1546, Martin Luther dies in the German town of Eisleben. With his death, the entire Protestant movement falters. The 62-year-old Luther has been the central figure of Protestantism. And you might say that the Reformation was running into the sands by the late 1550s. It took the reformed Protestants, John Calvin and his allies, uh, to rescue the Reformation at that stage. Calvinism begins to compete with Lutheranism within the Protestant community. The next hundred years will be drenched in the blood of holy wars as princes, kings, and emperors vie for power and land in the name of God. In Catholic England, though, reaction against these new ideas will take a violent form. Protestant ideas have infiltrated the society, but the reaction is savage. Bibles written in English are banned. Protestants are burned alive. Pope Leo X is grateful to England's King Henry VIII for his outspoken loyalty to the Catholic Church. So grateful, in fact, that in 1521, the Holy Father awards Henry the title of Defender of the Faith. But such loyalty to the Pope soon fades when Henry wants something that the Pope will not give him. He wants a divorce. He believes that Protestant ideas can now help him achieve this goal. One of the most radical things that Luther did was rarely noticed and is being noticed a good deal these days. He secularized marriage. That is, he said it is a civil right, not a religious right. This has radical implications. Though God may be joining a couple in marriage, man can break that bond. It's simply logical after that. But I think actually in the Reformation, this was one of the things which excited people. People in unhappy marriages, in those first open years of the Reformation, thought, oh, at last we can get rid of this, this relationship. In 1533, King Henry VIII is one of those unhappy people he wants to leave his wife Catherine of Aragon and marry his lover Anne Boleyn. But Pope Clement VII refuses to annul his marriage. Henry, defender of the faith, is outraged. He feels God wishes him to get rid of Catherine of Aragon, that they have never been married, and yet the Pope would not grant him the recognition of that. And therefore, the Pope is God's enemy. You have to remember how conceited Henry VIII is. God's will is that he should not be married to Catherine of Aragon. And that put him on the side of the Protestant reformers. Before Henry can break with the Catholic Church, he needs someone to make a convincing case. 
he finds his answer in a church official named Thomas Cranmer. Cranmer, it so happens, is secretly married. He married a German woman, the niece of a German reformer, at a time when he should not have got married at all. Uh, he was a priest, and clearly that was an act of rebellion against the old church. In 1533, King Henry learns his mistress Anne Boleyn is pregnant. So Cranmer, without the blessing of the Pope, secretly marries them. Two months later, Henry returns the favor and appoints Cranmer Archbishop of Canterbury. Thomas Cranmer was, of course, the first married archbishop. That made a huge difference, and he liked marriage, and he wrote this into the liturgy for the first time. The Book of Common Prayer has a marriage service, which is the first liturgy in the history of Christianity to say that marriage is fun. It is there for the mutual society comfort and help one from the other. The following year, the English Parliament passes the so-called Act of Supremacy, which says that the true head of the Church of England is the king, not the pope. Catholicism is banned. The Protestant faith takes its place. The shift gives Thomas Cranmer an enormous amount of power. Cranmer's a strange man. He's a, a quiet man, uh, a very sincerely religious man. But there's a certain sort of holy ruthlessness about Cranmer. One facet of Catholicism comes in for particular scorn. It's statues of Christ, the Virgin Mary, and the saints. Cranmer himself condemns what he calls the fantasy of ceremonies, pilgrimage, purgatory, saints, images, works, and such like, as hath these three or four hundred years been corruptly taught. Statues, stained glass, paintings, and tapestries were seen to encourage idolatry and false worship. In 1538, a set of laws are issued demanding the removal of feigned images so as to avoid that most detestable sin of idolatry. Catholic churches are brutally ransacked, monasteries stripped, and the king's coffers filled with the resulting wealth. It's difficult for us, I think, to understand why cultured, refined people smashed images. First starting point is that the Bible tells you so. In the commandments it says, thou shalt make no graven image unto thyself. This particular command resonates because images became the symbol of the great confidence trick which the old church had paid. It had got people to spend money on these things. It had got people to direct worship towards the statue, the image, instead of the divine thing behind it. At places like Binham Priory Church in England, Henry VIII's men destroy portraits of saints. Gold-leafed engravings are whitewashed over, and in their place, stark text from the Bible is painted. That's how it remains for hundreds of years, until the whitewash faded away, revealing some of their pre-Reformation glory. Yet art does not die under the Reformation. It undergoes its own revolution, the legacy of which hangs in our galleries and homes today. Both art and music became not only offerings to God, but expressions of our humanity, the wonder and the mystery of being human that is revealed in artistic expression. And once art was released from being an instrument of religion, this opened up the whole world as the domain of art. So the world of nature, the world of humanity, the world of everyday life, all of these became now no longer perhaps vehicles for transcendence or for salvation, but they became interesting in their own right. As a result of Martin Luther's idea that God is everywhere, Protestant artists search for inspiration in the real world around them. Works of art now had the function of being beautiful. In that sense, art for art's sake, as it will be called in the 19th century, begins through this separation of the artwork from its religious domain. By wiping out Catholic artworks, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer believes he has provided a foundation for Protestantism in England. But others feel he hasn't gone far enough.
In the 1500s, the Protestant Revolution is sweeping through Europe. A convergence of forces fans the flames of change. The once all-powerful Catholic Church is ruled by decadent popes. The printing press can spread ideas quickly. And a new era of learning is emerging from the Dark Ages. And that's the sort of powder keg into which Luther drops a match, as you might say. Human beings could be so much more. They're made in the image of God. That has to be restored. That powder keg will continue to show its destructive energy. In England, power will shift back and forth between Protestant and Catholic rulers in sometimes bloody conflict. There, where violence against Protestants was once especially vicious, Queen Mary comes to power in 1553 after her Protestant half-brother Edward dies. This daughter of King Henry VIII is, unlike her father, a devout Catholic. By the 1550s, England was beginning to become uh, a Protestant nation. But Mary tried to put a halt to all that. She took England back into Rome. Uh, the Catholic faith was brought back to England. Um, and as part of that, she persecuted uh, the people she regarded as heretics, Protestants. Queen Mary, or Bloody Mary, as she became known, starts one of the most violent purges of Protestants in history. Protestants are burned at the stake. Those who helped turn England to Protestantism are especially targeted. One of the most notable uh, of Queen Mary's victims uh, was the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, killed for his Protestantism. Bloody Mary dies in 1558. Her half-sister, Elizabeth, ascends to the throne. One of the first things she has to decide is what England's religion will be. I have to say, given the odds and options of that period, she came through pretty well. If she had gone radically Protestant, she might not have survived on the throne. Elizabeth returns the Church of England to Protestant hands. But for a group that becomes known as the Puritans, her brand of Protestantism is just not enough. Well, they're called Puritans because they wanted to purify the Church of England of all remaining vestiges of Catholicism. Anything which in any way resembled Catholic leftovers they wanted to be rid of. The Puritans emphasized the literal word of the Bible. They detest the ritual, hierarchy, and tradition of the Church of England. They also resent the way the monarchy supports the Church. For 50 years, the Puritans are largely tolerated in England. Then King Charles I ascends to the throne. Charles strongly believes that his authority is given by God. Charles I did not think the right the rule came from the people. Uh, none of those kings did. Uh, they all believed in divine right. Charles dismisses any questioning of his political or religious authority. Under his rule, Puritans are persecuted for their beliefs. Some have their ears severed for the crime of advocating religious tolerance. For many, the only way out is to leave England. On September 6, 1620, the Mayflower set sail for America. 37 of the ship's 102 passengers are Puritans. The earliest colonists said very explicitly, we are going there to complete the reformation of the church. Uh, they weren't as interested in founding a nation as they were in completing the reformation of the church. While the Puritans, both in England and America, agonize over whether God has chosen them for heaven or not, Protestants throughout Europe are trapped in a seemingly endless series of wars. From 1618 through 1648, religious hatreds and royal ambitions combine in a lethal cocktail known as the Thirty Years' War. Although it is fought mostly on German soil, 
The war involves, at one time or another, nearly every European political power. It's a purely religious... A lot of the religious people are very peaceful with each other, and yet uh, it got congealed around economics, territory, and religion. Devastating famine and disease follow the ongoing battles. Between 15 and 40 percent of the German population die premature deaths during this 30-year struggle. On October 24, 1648, the Peace of Westphalia is signed. Made up of a pair of treaties between German princes, Spain, France, Sweden, and the Dutch Republic, the Accords are a turning point in the Protestant Revolution. Lands secured by the Protestants are generally allowed to remain in Protestant control. In England, near the end of the Thirty Years' War, another war is starting, but this time it is purely Protestant versus Protestant, Puritan versus King. By the 1640s, King Charles I is widely regarded as a tyrant. He dissolves Parliament, imposes unpopular taxes, and tries to move the Church of England away from Calvinism. Puritans are enraged. Certainly, I think that the Puritans, being just people and um, people of faith, wanted to compromise with Charles, but he was not a compromiser. So, as a result, conflict. Eventually, those who oppose the king find a leader who can raise an army, a wealthy landowner named Oliver Cromwell. His belief in the pure word of the Bible reinforces a deeply traditional outlook on life. He is convinced King Charles is leading England astray. The Puritans demand vengeance. Quoting from the book of Daniel, they argue that a king who rules in an ungodly fashion needs to be overthrown. After Cromwell's forces defeat the king in 1648, he is convicted of treason. What many of those on the Puritan side, on the Cromwell side of, of the Civil War argued, was that King Charles had been beaten in battle, not once, but twice during the 1640s. And that showed God's displeasure with him, and that almost gave them the cause to execute him. On January 30th, 1649, Charles I walks onto a scaffold. So it's a very cold morning when he's executed. Charles doesn't want to appear that he's scared of death. Uh, and so in this, this sort of wonderful move, he wears two shirts so that he's not seen to be shivering because it's so cold. He wants to face his death uh, like a true martyr. It is a groundbreaking event in the history of Europe. The execution of a king who ruled, he thought, by divine favor, following a trial where he had been found guilty of treason, uh, was just this incredible moment for people uh, to get to grips with. The crowd collects gruesome souvenirs by dipping their handkerchiefs in royal blood. To the Puritans, this marks the cleansing of England. The monarchy is abolished. Between 1649 and 1653, England becomes a republic known as the Commonwealth of England, with Cromwell at the helm. Yet to many, Cromwell proves to be no better than Charles I. What is he doing in this country? Is he uh, restructuring it to make it safe for gentlemen? Or is it uh, a country which he's turning into the New Jerusalem? Cromwell never really decided and veered in the end to looking like an old-fashioned monarch. When Cromwell dies in 1658, his son takes over, but he is not an effective leader, and political turmoil engulfs the country once again. By 1660, King Charles II, the son of the murdered Charles I, 
is restored to the throne and with him a revived Church of England. But the legacy of Cromwell and the Puritans provides inspiration to others to challenge authority. The same ideals that guide Puritans through their moral crusades also guide some religious groups in a very different direction. What many of these groups shared was this idea that they were saved, and that they were predestined to heaven, and as such, they could pretty much do what they like. The result? An explosion of rebellion, immorality, and sexual license that will seem more like the 1960s than the 1660s. By the late 1600s, the Protestant Revolution has turned Europe upside down, bringing both progress and bloodshed in its wake. Two English civil wars have been fought between rival Protestant groups. King Charles II is in power, and the Church of England is once again the sole official religion. But just as the Church is consolidating its power in England, splinter groups emerge determined to defy it. There is this incredible outpouring uh, of, of communities, of sects, many amongst the sort of artisan uh, class in the early 1650s, doing what they like, all of which absolutely terrified the existing authorities. Nearly 500 years after Martin Luther began to redefine sex, marriage and family life, his world-changing ideas are all around us, in every street and in every city. The legacy of the Protestant Revolution is still framing debate, still causing outrage, still influencing public and private lives. The most important legacy of the Reformation is that phrase which Martin Luther never said, here I stand, I can do no other. An individual must stand before God or before fate and make decisions for him or herself. Once the medieval Catholic mold was broken, there was never going to be an absolute guarantee that there wouldn't be more splits and debates. And so there are. We're not faced, I think, with a new kind of crisis, but with a, a rather acute version of some of the same problems that there were for our ancestors.